Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. So, <clears throat> welcome back. At this point in our program, we go around and introduce ourselves. And once again, um, as an experiment, I encourage you to speak mindfully when you say your name. And that might mean um, pausing a moment to see what's going on with your body right in that moment, which is different than the previous moment. It might mean being aware of what happens with your breath when you speak. Just whatever it means to be mindful. You should say your name. My name's David Lewis. I'm Peter. I'm Dan. My name is Gary. Thomas. My name is Michael. I'm Kay Matsuda. My name is Michael. My name is Roy. Jose. My name is Joe Castro Vinci. My name is Bobby. I'm Paul. My name is Clint. Todd Hoyle. My name is Oswaldo. My name is Frank. I'm Tom. Leor. My name is Lee Robbins. I'm Richard. My name is Jerry. I'm Jim Stewart. My name is Sean Clark. My name is Michael. I'm called George. My name is Tage. I'm Eric. Peter. My name is Daniel. My name is Mark. James. John. My name is Jerry Jones. Marty. I'm Jay Davidson. I'm Joe Good. Thank you. That was lovely. Usually, um, well, very often for me, I notice that when I come to Sangha, this Sangha or other Sanghas, or when I'm on a retreat, I get kind of excited when it's time for the Dharma talk. Um, and when I'm mindful of that, I realize that what's going on is my busy little ego really wants to get back to discursive thinking. Like, okay, that meditation part is over now, now I can get back in thinking mode again. So that's why I want to encourage you this morning, um, if you choose to do so, to kind of play with the idea of staying in a meditative state, even during the Dharma talk. It's possible to divide your attention, to kind of halfway listen to a talk and halfway stay with your breath or with your body or whatever the object of your meditation is. It's also possible to not listen to the talk at all and just let the sound of my voice be a sound that passes through you. And if you want to do that, I invite you to. Close your eyes, stay on meditating, just let my voice be a noise. I won't be offended. And it's probably a better use of your time <laughs> than listening to a Dharma talk. <clears throat> or whatever you normally do. The Buddha taught that um, Buddha wisdom, the wisdom that he taught, only comes from direct experience. It doesn't come from discursive thinking. 
You've probably heard, I know I have here before, that the Buddha said, um, don't listen to teachers, don't listen to me, don't take my word for it, check it out for yourself. And when he advised that, and he did it repeatedly in the suttas, he wasn't saying, um, look at this dogma versus that dogma and make your and think about it and make your choice about what makes most sense for you. What he was suggesting is that you consult your direct experience. And direct experience isn't about thinking. It's an intuitive knowing. And that kind of intuitive knowing is what arises during meditation. It arises when we're um, engaged with our direct experience. Thinking is not direct experience. Thinking, as soon as we get caught in a line of thought, which happens all the time, as we well know, we're either in the past or the future or we're someplace other than the present moment. So the way the Buddha recommended staying in the present moment was being aware of your senses, being aware of your body, your eyes, your ears, your nose, your taste. Even being aware of your thoughts, but only not as thinking, aware of your thoughts as these little bubbles that arise not by your own choosing, they just arise and they pass away. Just as thoughts arise and pass away, smells arise and pass away. So that's why my theme today is kind of trying to keep, keep us grounded in our direct experience because that's where the present moment happens. As soon as we step away from a direct experience, we're someplace other than the present moment. And the present moment is where happiness happens in the Buddha, in Buddha, in Buddha Dharma. Upandita, who's a <clears throat> Burmese meditation teacher, a very revered meditation teacher, says, our problems arise when we subordinate this moment to our desires. We drift away from our direct experience and take up residence in our thoughts and hopes. So, you probably all noticed already this morning, that's what happens when we meditate. We kind of drift away from our direct experience and get caught up in our thoughts and hopes in the past and the future, whatever's bubbling up. But we have the option, we have the choice of coming back to our direct experience. And that's the practice of meditation. It, uh, it breaks my heart sometimes when I tell friends or family, people that I, that I meditate or that I'm going on a retreat, and a lot of times I get the response, oh, I tried meditation, I can't do that. And it breaks my heart because what they were doing is probably very good meditation, but it just didn't, they didn't think it was. Um, if I ask them about it, They'll say, oh, well, you know, my mind was just all over the place, or I couldn't stay calm, or it doesn't, didn't feel tranquil. So people have this idea that meditation is tranquility, and if you don't have tranquility, you're doing something wrong, or you're failing. Not the case. Good meditation is coming back to direct experience over and over again. I just heard recently, was on, I was on a retreat, and I heard a teacher tell um, a little story about an interview that he had with a student on, I don't know if it was that retreat or another one. <clears throat> but after a 45 minute sitting, the teacher asked the student, how many mind states did you have? A mind state could be a thought, an emotion, you know, just any of that stuff that comes up when we're, comes up in our mind. And the teacher asked the student, how many mind states did you have in 45 minutes, in a 45 minute sitting? And the, stu and the student said, only three. And the teacher said, that's really remarkable. He said, how long did they last? And the student said, oh, about 15 minutes each. <laughs> so, the story goes on, the teacher asked the same student at the end of the retreat, same question, 45 minutes sitting, how many mind states did you have? 
And the student said, oh, about 45. And the teacher said, great improvement. Because when your mind state only lasts for a minute or for 30 seconds and you come back to your direct experience, that's a successful moment of meditation. So if that student had 45 mind states and came back 45 times to the object of meditation, that's a lot better than drifting off for 15 minutes at a time and thinking land. And chances are, I would guess, he didn't say this, chances are I would guess that Maybe that student had 45 mind states in 45 minutes, but I doubt there were a minute, there were probably 30 seconds. And there was probably a pause in between them. There was probably, maybe, if he's lucky, 30 minutes of silence in between. <coughs> that's the tranquility of meditation. And that's where happiness arises. That little space of emptiness in between thoughts. So sometimes you hear um, instructors, meditation instructors, talk about um, watching the breath and watching the breath very carefully and, and paying attention to the pauses in between breaths or the pause between the in-breath and the out-breath. Those little empty moments at the beginning of an in-breath, the end of an out-breath, the pause between thoughts, is the tranquility of meditation. And that's where wisdom arises and that's where Buddha's happiness happens. Buddha's word for happiness, uh, the Pali word for happiness, is sukha, which sounds a lot like dukkha. And dukkha, you all probably know, is uh, gets talked about a lot more than sukha. Dukkha is the Buddhist word for suffering or unreliability or discontent. Um, there's a lot of definitions for it. But sukha is happiness. And um, I've been doing a little research on this for the past few months. Sukha comes up a lot in the suttas. Buddha talks about sukha all the time. And there's a different kind of sukha for almost every stage of the whole meditative path. There's a lot of different, there's different kinds of sukha. And I'm not going to talk about them all today, but I want to talk about kind of the fundamental distinction that the Buddha made between worldly happiness and the happiness that arises from meditation, from being in our direct experience, the happiness that comes from being in the present moment. So I'll only burden you, hopefully, with two more Pali words. The um, Buddha's word uh, for worldly happiness, the happiness we get from our sense pleasures, the kind of happiness that you and I experience when we're out in the world doing our thing and being happy, when we you know, have something good to eat or see a fun movie or run into a friend on the street, that kind of happiness comes from, the, the Buddha described it as coming from sense pleasures, because it usually involves our senses, and he called that lokiya sukha as opposed to happiness that arises from meditation, which is he called Lakutra Sukha. And the difference is this. Lokiya Sukha, or worldly happiness, it's not a bad thing, but it's temporary. It comes and goes, it passes. And it usually has something to do with attachment or grasping. It's something that we want. We want good food. We want to enjoy our friends. We go looking for our friends to spend time with them, to be happy. We want a good relationship. We want this, we want that, to make us happy. We spend a phenomenal amount of our time going out looking for happiness. There's nothing wrong with this. But there's a but but we tend to get attached to that. And that which we get attached to is temporary. So it passes. And then there's discontent. So there's very often dukkha that arises with worldly happiness. Dukkha that arises with lokiya sukha, 
And that's that dukkha of wanting it forever, wanting to hold on to it, wanting to have more of it. It's another um, aspect of worldly happiness that when we find a little bit of something we like, we usually want more. So that's discontent. If, if you want more, if you, if you don't have enough of, what's a, of a good thing, you're discontented. If you want to get rid of something, that's aversion. That's discontent. If you want to get, a, get rid of something that's blocking your happiness. So I'm not recommending, and nor did the Buddha, that you give up worldly happiness or sense pleasures. They're a good thing. But just... Try to be mindful and try to not get too attached and try to see when dukkha arises around the ways that we go looking for happiness in the world. So Lakutra Sukha, the Sukha that arises from meditation, happens in a completely different manner. In fact, almost the opposite. Lakutra Sukha is about letting go. Instead of attaching to something, instead of having something, Lakutra Sukha is about letting go. And that's what we do when we meditate. And we, um, we're we sitting, um, focusing on our object of meditation, and a thought comes, or a, a worry, or a plan, or an idea. What do we do? If we're mindful, we let go of it. We just let it be. We don't suppress it, we don't judge it, we don't attach to it, we just let it go, come back to our direct experience. So the practice of meditation, once again, is this process of staying with our direct experience in the present moment and letting go over and over again of that which we attach to. Sometimes it's not even actually letting go. If you don't attach to it, you don't have to let go, you just let it be. A thought might bubble up if you don't if you don't ride that wave, it'll just pass. But most of us just can't help but getting attached to our thoughts because that's what we do for most of our day, and that it involves a process of letting go. It's the simple, very simple act of letting go. Ajahn Chah, who is uh, another venerated um, meditation, well, he's died now, 20 years ago, but he was one of the um, primary leading Thai masters of the 20th century. Um, his whole teaching was based around letting go. He thought letting go was the whole of the Dark Dharma. It was all about letting go. And he has a very famous expression, which I just love, he said, let go a little bit, and you'll be a little bit free. He said, let go some more, and you'll be some more free. Let go completely, and you'll be completely free. And you could substitute happiness for free. Say, let go a little bit, you'll be a little bit happy. Let go a lot, you'll be completely happy. So that's the Buddha's idea of happiness. And it's not, in my experience, it's not <clears throat> like Nibbana. It's not like, um, it doesn't take a whole lot of advanced meditation or many hours or many retreats or many days. It's something that actually some of you may have experienced this morning. The happiness that comes very calm happiness that arises because you've let go. You've let go of your thoughts, of your worries, of your plans, of past and future. You've just allowed yourself, maybe during the meditation, maybe right now, you've just allowed yourself to be in the present moment. And this happiness is, is very calm. It's very tranquil. It's not exciting like sense pleasure happiness. And I think a lot of times we miss it. I was talking to um, a friend about, a, a Dharma friend, about this topic a while back. 
And she said, oh, she said, yeah, she said, worldly happiness is like uh, whitewater rafting. And, and the happiness that comes from letting go is like floating on a calm pond on an on a inner tube on a sunny day, and you can just be there all the time. So I thought that was great because, you know, white, I love whitewater rafting. It's really fun. It's intense. It's got a charge. Um, it's exciting. But it's fairly, um, it's, it's, it's got fairly short duration, duration. You know, you go down the rapids and then it's over. And then, then you want to go back and do it again, right? Duga. Because <laughs> I want more of that. But um, Lakutra Sukha, the Sukha that comes from letting go in meditation, is a calm, peaceful, um, kind of non eventful sort of happiness that lasts for a long time if you're aware of it. It's actually kind of a renunciation practice, which is kind of a, in our culture, a no-no word, renunciation. Nobody likes that. But it's about giving up something. It's giving up your habitual thought patterns, your habitual mind patterns. I uh, just took a breath. I um, read an article in a magazine about a month ago about uh, Bangladesh, which has a population of about 160 million people, which is about the same population as Russia, but they're living in a space the size of Louisiana. And like Louisiana, uh, or at least the Delta, um, most of Bangladesh is a delta, is a river delta, and you probably know that it floods at least a couple of times a year, and they get hurricanes, have incredible disasters. But there are times where most of the country just completely floods. And um, so I was reading this article about Bangladesh, and one of the people that the, the <laughs> journalist interviewed was uh, a man that. Um, lived on a char, and a char is a, a sandbar. It's the <clears throat> word for sandbar in Bangladesh. Sandbar out in the middle of the river. And these sandbars appear and disappear with every big rain, with every storm. So this guy actually builds his house and plants his garden and, and, and has his family on sandbars that come and go. And they do this for many generations. There's a whole class of people that are that are known as char dwellers. So um, what a metaphor for impermanence. Huh? It, for this guy, it's not a metaphor. But um, so the journalist was asking him, you know, how, how do you do it? And he says, well, you know, the house is modular. We can take it apart and put it back together again in six or eight hours. So, you know, we can play, we get a, a, a garden planted in a day. He says, you know, it's just how we live. And the journalist said, well, how do you deal with this emotionally? I mean, how'd your mind deal with knowing that, you know, your home's temporary? And he said, we try not to think too much. <laughs> And that just struck me as great dharma. <laughs> That's, you know, we think our lives are permanent, and we think we have you know, kind of solid homes and solid relationships and solid jobs. And these events happen during the course of our lives, and we realize it's not all as solid as we think. So, in a sense, we're all char dwellers. And what's the solution? Don't think too much. You just get overwhelmed. There'd be nothing but worry. And that's what the Buddha taught. Stay with your direct experience. Like the char dweller, deal with the task at hand. You know, if you're 
putting your house together or taking it apart. Just put the house together. Take it apart. Don't worry about the next storm. It's not going to do you any good. I just want to say a few words about um, this attachment business because um, I don't want to give the idea that it's bad. It's just something that we do. It's also called clinging. It's related to craving. The um, Pali word for clinging is upadana. And it's a great word and a great metaphor because that's also the word for fuel, like fuel that you feed a fire or, or run your tractor on. Um, but that's basically what we do. When we cling, when we attach, um, thoughts bubble up, feelings come out of nowhere, and we attach to them. And basically what attaching to them does means we feed them. We feed that fire. We encourage, you know, subconsciously, usually, we encourage that whole process of feeding our thoughts. And all of a sudden we find that we've, you know, just ridden that wave all the way into the beach and we're someplace far away from our direct experience. We come back to it. So it's important not to be judgmental with ourselves about what our minds do. That's our conditioning. That's, that's we were, the way we were raised and, and educated. The whole Western educational system is about figuring things out and discursive thinking and coming to an understanding of things. We weren't trained to think intuitively and we weren't trained to let go of our thoughts. So, so much of Dharma practice, you may or may not have noticed, so much of Dharma practice is counterintuitive for Westerners. You know, the idea of um, this 50 of us, however many of us are, coming into this room this morning and being silent for an hour is pretty unusual in our culture. I'm, uh, I'm always greatly moved by this sangha and by a, a room full of people in our culture that are willing to be quiet together. And people that are willing to be quiet at home, those of the that have a home practice. It's really quite a remarkable thing. And in doing so, we're reconditioning ourselves and reconditioning our minds. So from a psychological perspective, that's what happens with meditation practices, we're gradually reconditioning our minds to be at peace rather than to be busy. It's said that every moment of mindfulness, every moment we spend in mindfulness, displaces or reconditions a moment of conditioning. So the more you do it, the, like anything else, the better you get. The Buddha used... Um, frequently use music as a metaphor for um, learning meditation and, and practicing the Dharma. Uh, and he used it in all different kinds of ways. But one of the, one of the examples is he used it as like tuning a string on an instrument uh, is you learn how to not put too much effort or not too little effort into your practice. But the way I like to use med- music as a metaphor is that meditation is like learning how to play the piano. And those people I mentioned earlier that have said to me, gee, I tried meditation once and it didn't work, I can't do that, so I gave up. It's like someone saying, I tried the piano once and I couldn't do it. You have to play scales. You have to practice. That's why it's called practice. And it's a little um, tiresome and a little cumbersome sometimes. It's harder at the beginning than it is 
when you get some experience. But like learning to play an instrument or a sport, you develop this skill. It's, it's a skill that can be developed. And you start to realize the benefit of it. We gradually recondition our minds. Such a rare thing in our culture. So the reason... Um, is anybody still in touch with their object of meditation? You don't have to put up your hand. Just checking. The reason I've been encouraging that is because I want to encourage you to not think about meditation as something that just happens on the cushion. You can be in touch with your breath, in touch with your body, in touch with your direct experience in any way that you're in touch with your direct experience and go about your day. You can get by thinking probably 75% less than you think on a daily basis and manage your life just fine. You know, you're not going to crumple into a ball of um, incapacity if we think less. That also is pretty counterintuitive in our culture. You probably notice when you leave the Dharma Hall or even go out to our social hour that all of a sudden the mind gears up it's pretty impossible for it not to when we're using words. One of the interesting phenomena that's going on right now in our culture, in the world, that just fascinates me from a Dharma perspective is, is the um, smartphone culture. <laughs> And I'm starting to think of smartphones as just as an extension of the mind. And you see them, of course, everywhere, on the streets, in the cafes. Used to be if you go to a cafe, there'd be people kind of, you know, sipping the coffee and talking to their friend or staring off into space. You don't see that much anymore. <laughs> you know, at bus stops, people don't stand, sit there and stare off into space. Which can be a direct experience, staring off into space being with the body. So what I see with smartphones and what interests me is I see a lot of agitation. A lot of not being comfortable in the present moment. Not being comfortable with boredom. Even just a momentary boredom of being waiting for your friend to use the bathroom while you're in the cafe, check your phone. Mm -hmm. You know, that's all about being in the moment. And when we're thinking and when we're checking our smartphones, we're not being in the moment. We're agitated. So the more I reflect on this, the less judgmental I get about people and their smartphones. And I've got a phone. But I kind of started out being really annoyed by the number of people that are on their phones all the time. And I've noticed, you know, some friends and people close to me, I'm pretty sure are addicted. You know, I know a 20-year-old girl that cannot have a conversation without looking at her phone about every 20 seconds. But what I'm realizing is it's the same phenomena that goes on when we're sitting here meditating and our, and our attention, our, our mind wants to go elsewhere. Our mind doesn't want to be in the present moment. Our ego doesn't want to be in the present moment. It wants to attach to something. It wants to grasp. So it goes looking for a new thought, new experience, something to think about. But now we have these little you know, electronic devices that assist us in that process. And I kind of, you know, well, so I'm a meditator. I'm a meditation junk, junkie. I think that's a problem. <laughs> that's, 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 that's my evaluation. But... We will wait and see. But I don't think that's where happiness is going to come from for most people. Certainly not Lakutra Sukha. It's not the Sukha that comes from letting go, from being quiet.
So here's a poem. Oh. First, here's a quote from our website. Somebody posted this on our Yahoo group. A, a, a really lovely message a couple of days ago. Somebody I don't know. But they posted it on Yahoo group, so I'm taking it as public information. My apologies. If, 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 if it's because I didn't ask permission to use it. But it's on our group. And this is just a two-sentence quote from um, this person's posting. Take a look at our group. Sometimes there's useful things there, our Yahoo group. But this person said, Our true selves need nothing to be happy. Nothing. In fact, the more people need this or that, even other people in relationships, success, whatever, the more they suffer. So this brings up the idea that the happiness that comes from letting go is not something that you get. And it's not something you achieve. And it's not something that meditation gives you. It's something that resides within you all the time. Your fundamental Buddha nature is happy. You are fundamentally happy. But we cover it up with all of our this or that, people in relationships, looking for happiness, thinking that happiness is, is there, not here. So the happiness that I'm talking about this morning, um, don't go meditating in order to get it. It's a, it's a side effect. It comes from letting go. So here's a poem that kind of relates and kind of doesn't. But it's definitely got a lot of dharma. It's by um, Jack Gilbert. And it's called A Brief for the Defense. Sorrow everywhere. Slaughter everywhere. If babies are not starving someplace, they're starving someplace else. With flies in their nostrils. But we enjoy our lives because that's what God wants. Otherwise, the mornings before summer dawn would not be made so fine. The Bengal tiger would not be fashioned so miraculously well. The poor woman at the fountain are laughing together between their suffering they have known and the awfulness in their future, smiling and laughing while somebody in the village is very sick. There's laughter every day in the terrible streets of Calcutta. And the women laugh in the cages of Bombay. If we deny our happiness, resist our satisfaction, we lessen the importance of their deprivation. We must risk delight. We can do without pleasure, but not delight, not enjoyment. We must have the stubbornness to accept our gladness in the ruthless furnace of this world. To make injustice the only measure of our attention is to praise the devil. If the locomotive of the Lord runs us down, we should give thanks that the end has magnitude. We must admit that there will be music despite everything. We stand at the prow again of a small ship anchored late at night in a tiny port, <clears throat> looking over to the sleeping island. The waterfront is three shuttered cafes and one naked light burning. To hear the faint sound of the oars in the silence as the rowboat comes slowly out and then goes back is truly worth all the years of sorrow that are to come. So thank you for your attention and thank you um, for experimenting with me and maintaining mindfulness through our morning together and um, thank you most of all for your practice.
Are there any announcements? Terry. Thanks, David, for today. Moving through jobs, that's great. Um, next week, our speaker will be Larry Robinson, who's been here before. Was really enjoyed last time. Yeah. Uh, Clint. Yeah. Uh, just want to know the Himalayan fair is going on today in Berkeley at Library of Art. It's going to be a fun event. Where in Berkeley? Sorry. Live Oak Park. Live Oak Park. Jim? Yeah. Um, Cass Brayton um, is having a reading of a play that is written this afternoon at 2 o'clock at Thick House, which is a small theater on 18th Street on, in Petrol Hill near Arkansas. Um, he's a wonderful playwright, so I recommend it. I also have a, Can we have some questions? Oh, I forgot about questions. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, wonderful, as always. What about reading? Why does reading bring me so much joy? I mean, it's all in my head. I'm not mindful of my posture. I, I'm totally absorbed elsewhere. Um, and that is, I feel true joy when I'm absorbed in a good book. Well, I guess it counts as a sense pleasure. It's actually my favorite one, too. Um, and I reflect on that quite a bit because I read a lot. I really, like you, I really love to read. And I realize that I'm not mindful most of the time when I'm reading. But it's a sense pleasure. You know, why do I like sitting in the sun on a beautiful day? That's a sense pleasure. Why do I like a nice glass of wine? Why do I like, you know, it's, it's not that the sense pleasures are wrong. And reading, I guess, is a sense pleasure in the sense that it's, it's, it's not your sense, it's, it's your mind that's being entertained. We, lo we love to learn. Um, I, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But it's not intuitive learning. It's, it's the kind of learning that we did in school, which I get a charge out of. I still like to learn that way. It's, you know, that's why I like to listen to Dharma talks. It's, but there's a different kind of, of, of learning, which is intuitive learning, which comes from, it's just different. Mm -hmm. It comes from direct experience. Mm -hmm. It's not that one's not better or worse, yeah. they're just, okay. you know, just different. Thank you. Uh, just to follow that up, I like reading a lot too. I thought it was an interesting question. And, it strikes me that when I'm reading, or anybody's reading with that kind of intenseness, one is in the present moment. Mm -hmm. To say otherwise assumes that <clears throat> this illusionary reality, and I'm using the word with not a lot of discussion, but this illusionary reality is the, is the reality. Is the reality of the moment, right. Yeah. And, well, no, no, but I mean, Say, well, if we're reading and our mind is someplace else, that's not real. This is real. Oh, I hear you. That's not the Buddhist yeah. perspective on yeah. Yeah. the two yeah. levels of reality. Yeah. <clears throat> Although when I read, it sort of depends on what I'm reading, but when I'm reading, yeah. sometimes you know I'm far in the future or far in the past. Or, but that's the reality. But that's reality, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. One final point. There's a very interesting line here. I like books on tape but I don't like just reading books, and yet I can listen to a book on tape mindfully, or at least I think I can, in much the way that I sat and listened to music sure. as well. Yeah. So it's kind of this interesting gray zone between this is reading and this isn't. What, what I try to do with reading, when I try to be more mindful about it, is just like everybody else, sometimes I don't really want to be in the present moment. And if I'm home, I'll... Uh, I just automatically will pick up a book. It's my favorite thing to do. The other thing I might do is check my email, or you know, check the smartphone, or or go get something to eat, or you know, all these little distractions we have. So it's you know, it's not that the distractions are bad, but it's really useful to be mindful of um, the urge to be doing something other than what we're doing right now. I, 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 meditate, I, I told a meditation teacher <clears throat> in an interview once that I was bored on a retreat. I said, I'm bored. And she said, 
boredom is about three millimeters away from tranquility. <laughs> says, you know, when, when we get bored and we go distract ourselves, it's a real shame because we're three millimeters away from tranquility. So stay with the boredom and, and, and see, what's, see what's behind that. Before you check your email or your smartphone or, or, or pick up a book, in my case. Yeah, Clint? Okay, I'm just, I'm just trying to play with these, these concepts that have been brought out. Um, you know, reading or maybe watching a movie or something like that. Um, aren't you in the present moment? The present moment is you're, you're reading this story that you're at the present moment engaged with. Is, is that kind of well but your direct ex- your, in reading your direct experience actually the direct experience part of it is that I mean, your, your, your body is holding a book and your eyes are meeting an image that's a direct experience and you're, and you're engaged in the story now, are we reading the book and I was thinking about dinner or thinking about something else are we not reading the present book that's, that's the mental effort that's the, that's, the, that's the part that's I would say is not direct experience it's, yeah. it's the thinking part but still you're holding this book it's when you, when you meditate and you, and you pay attention to your direct experience it's possible to hear a sound as I was saying earlier it's possible to hear a sound just as a sound and if you don't give it a name if you don't say, ah, oh, that's a door closing, or that's David's voice, if you just, if your ear meets that sound and it's a pure moment of consciousness, that's direct experience. But as soon as you, as soon as that sound becomes a bunch of words coming out of my mouth that you're interpreting and coming to an understanding of or disagreeing with, that's discursive thought. Oh, okay. I would have thought that could possibly be in the present moment too. I'm listening to the, to the what you're saying that's okay I'm, I'm, all right. I, I don't want to like well that was your point so I, I th- it, yeah I think it's debatable it depends on your experience and also look at me one interesting experiment I, I do is when I hear something I, I, I try to see if I can hear I, I try to see when the judgment comes in like that's, that's an attractive noise or that's an irritating noise but, but just to hear the noise first and then to see how quickly it falls into a yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? It is. Yeah. The, the, the Buddha actually has a flow chart of how that happens, and it's called, it's one of his most important original um, ideas, and it's called dependent origination. And what happens, in a nutshell, <laughs> with dependent origination is you have a sense contact. Say, your, your ear hears my voice. And that's just pure contact. The first thing that happens after pure contact is, and this all happens in a split second, the whole chain. The first thing that happens is you find my voice either pleasant or unpleasant or neutral, universal. Every sense contact you have is either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And the next step on the chain after that is if it's pleasant, you like it. If it's unpleasant, you don't like it. So the flowchart splits that. So we'll just go with the pleasant. So your ear hears my voice, and let's say it's unpleasant for you. Next step is you don't like it. Next step is you want it to stop, or you want to be someplace else, or you want to change your experience. The next step is it, it leads to, to hate. And... If you like it, the next step is pleasant. The step after that is you want it. The next step after that is you crave it. You attach to it. You got to have it. And in either case, in, in, in both both branches of dependent origin of, 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 of the flow chart of dependent origination, they both end up in suffering. So the Buddha is recommending is just keep working back in your experience, and if you can get to that point, at least in meditation, where you just have direct experience and you don't go anywhere with it, there's there's peace and tranquility. So I, I think it's worth remembering the Buddhist statement that I teach one thing and one thing only, that suffering and release from suffering. And so with that perspective, this issue of right concentration, which is, I mean, I think what mindfulness and meditation are about it's not really an end it's a means to an end 
Right. It's, Thank you. And so if it's useful, it's useful at, at releasing suffering. And if reading releases you from suffering, um, yeah. then that's Buddhism, I think. Yeah, I agree. Thank you. Yeah, it's such a beautiful concept. I teach only suffering and, the, and the, the end of suffering. The Buddha didn't talk as much as we do in these Dharma talks. <laughs> the, the, the Buddha just wouldn't go there with metaphysical concepts. He refused to. He would either not answer a question, or he would say, I teach only, if it doesn't pertain to suffering or the end, the end of suffering, then it's not worth talking about. Clint. This is good. No, it's good. Because I don't know if I want to be a person where um, a car honking and some and the Baldi playing music. I have the same reaction to, which is like no reaction. I mean, is, is, is that such an attractive state to be in? You say your reaction is no reaction. Well, well it seems to me. You're, the, the, if I agree, but the desirable state would be where you don't judge the noise, but where, uh, as an example, where, where a car honking is the same as hearing the Four Seasons by Vivaldi, that you have the same reaction, which is, which is like no reaction. And uh, if that's true, I don't, I don't know if I want to be there. You know, I mean, I'd like to be able to. Have no, it, well, it's not saying that it's it's not okay to have pleasant experiences. It's it's fine to have pleasant experiences. What dependent origination is about is paying attention to, the, to you, the, you, the very minute details of your conscious process, knowing that your mind is attracted to the pleasant and repelled by the unpleasant. I mean, that's just a fact of life. It happens. Yeah. Okay, so it's not true. Okay. So it's not and, and you can, and it's possible to let sound, smells... Um, to just be direct experience. I'm not saying that's what we should be doing all the time. But, well, there's somebody on this retreat I was just on that asked a question in public and said, I'm just being, I'm being driven nuts by, by these sounds. The person next to me is fidgeting and somebody, somebody back there is clearing their throat and somebody's moving their chair and... It's making me crazy. He says, I can't meditate. It's just impossible for me. The problem isn't the sounds. The problem is his response to the sounds. Was his response to his sounds. So what we're talking about here is our responses. You know, it's not... Somebody might find a, a car honking to be a pleasant sound, and somebody else might hate the Valdi. It's just, you know, different response. And so that way you're not upset when you're listening to a Baldi in a car honks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't get thrown into a fit of rage or something. Yeah, right. What's a quick and dirty way to get back to neutrality when that car honking? Good question. Really Direct experience. Just what we are doing this morning. Just, you know, the the... A great Dharma concept that, that exists in our culture beyond the Buddhist world is take a deep breath. You know, just take a deep breath, get into your body. I think the notion of impermanence helps in that situation as well. Sure. That that one is really annoying me now, and glad it's not going to be there forever. You know, it's not forever. Yeah. Forever. yeah. Well, the, the problem is that there isn't, at least we don't know of one, a quick and dirty way. And that's why we're here doing this stuff on concentration, practicing so that when that car honks in the middle of all the concert, we'll have learned to stay focused on the body. Not that I can do it, but that's the idea. Yeah. I think I did it this morning. <laughs> I was racing to get here. I hate being late. My neighbors blocked my car. They were slow in letting me out. I, was, I still had 20 minutes to make it. And then I got to the park and stayed at Rakers. <laughs> so I had to let it go completely. And I just focused on the fact that it was a gorgeous day. The quality of light was very high clarity. You know, and I just had... Traffic was terrible, and I was just floated on this little wave of enjoying the beauty of the day. 
This was not a conscious decision. It was just... Um, I would say that might be the re result of your practice, however. <laughs> well, I definitely let go of getting here on time. You know, that was just making me suffer. That's why we meditate. Yeah. What a lovely thing. Everyday life, it just happens. Yeah. Well, that may be the only thing you can ever <laughs> learn from me. <laughs> well, this is just great. I love, great. really love talking to you guys about practice. It's like my favorite thing. So, um, thank you for your time. And if you want to hang out and talk more about practice or anything else, you know, that's, that happens next. Host. Oh, and we have a host. Thank you yes. for reminding me, Kai. Well, thank you for the talk. And I'm the host this morning. I'm Kei Matsuda, and I'd like to welcome all of you to GBF. And please stay for the social period. Uh, David this morning told us that happiness is a sukkah, but I would say that happiness is sugar. That's what you get for some uh, cookies and, and strawberries. Uh, if you take uh, tea, please wash the cups and put them back. Uh, there's also sign up sheet for newcomers, and some people go out and have lunch together around 12.30, some meet the group uh, near the front door, and finally they'll be coming around with Donna Ball, and suggested donation is 5 to $8, and we Thank you, Kay. Let's gather in a circle. So the Buddha also taught that our meditation practice is not a narcissistic activity. It's not just for us alone. Like a butterfly beating its wings in Brazil and causing a tropical storm in the Pacific, our practice here benefits beings everywhere in ways that we cannot even begin to imagine. So may the merit of our practice here together this morning benefit all beings May all beings find peace and tranquility. May all beings be happy. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers, so you can participate live. Please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.